introduce himself and tell you who he is and just let you know that he he runs is chair of the bc Ed aviation museum and um i just found out that he probably flew me to hong kong a few times <laughs> about 10 years ago so here he is well thank you very much is this mic about the right level for people I just need to know that it's not like here. Okay. <laughs> well, as it says, um, uh, we're, I'm going to talk about the history of, uh, of, of aviation in Victoria uh, up until 1945. And at the end, of, then I'll take over and say what we're doing at the BC Aviation Museum. Uh, I don't know if you've seen in the papers lately, there's been a lot of talk of uh, the Martin Mars coming to the uh, Aviation Museum and then, of course, the arrival of our uh, F-104 Starfighter just a couple of weeks ago. So a lot of interesting things there. Um, I'll just go right into it. Today's presentation, I'm going to talk, I'm going to tell you who I am uh, the uh, and what my background is. History of Victoria, we talked about that, aviation and what the future has. And this picture here, why have I thrown that in? I was, after um, a, a long career in military and commercial aviation, I took a, a, a job with a small airline on the coast here and I was flying over Comox one day and the snowbirds did a loop beside me. And I thought, that's cool. No, th they would normally clear you well out of that area. But when I told them, well, I'm X Demon 51 from 407 Squadron, they said, hey, guess what? We got, a, we got something for you. Um, so my, my flying background is I was in the military for 17 years. I went to Royal Roads for four years and took a degree in physics and physical oceanography. Uh, and then uh, from 74 to 78, they... Uh, instead of going on a fighter tour, they sent me to, at the last minute, they sent me to maritime patrol. So for two and a half years, I flew on the Canadair Argus, uh, this old piston engine anti-submarine aircraft. And of course, this is the height of the Cold War. So what I did for the next 12 years was track Russian nuclear submarines in the Atlantic and the Pacific. Uh, so I was a navigator initially. So where are my navigator wings? Here are my navigator wings. And who wants to be a navigator for your whole life? Uh, so I was very fortunate. They allowed two navigators a year to cross train. And I did that. And I went on to the Aurora, which was brand new in 1980. We're still using them. Okay. <laughs> so I became a pilot, um, a crew commander on, uh, on 407 Squadron. I then eventually an uh, Aurora instructor down in Greenwood. And then I flew as an exchange officer flying this aircraft called the uh, British Aerospace uh, Nimrod uh, out of Kinloss in Scotland with 206 Squadron. Um, the relevance to uh, astronomy is that uh, as navigators, we uh, were trained in astronavigation. And at one time I could tell you all our 57 navigation stars that's over 40 years ago and my memory's starting to fade a little bit but um i remember the first time uh using this colesman b2 periscopic sextant where we do a two minute uh timed uh sighting on our selected star after doing the, all the manual pre-computations and setting it up on the in in the uh the astrodome there and looking out and there was a star i couldn't believe it not only that, that you could take using what we call the uh, Mark St. Hilaire method of uh, assumed positions. That's how we plotted our navigation uh, uh, or, or astronomical sightings. And it made this little cocked hat. And right in the middle was where we were. And I went, I checked it against the Amiga. I went, good grief, this works. Fascinating. <laughs> and so um, then I started to get cocky. You know, I would do going east west one day across the the um, Atlantic. I said I will do a Mer Pass sunshot. Of course, Mer Pass. You meant you get your time, do your arc to time conversion, and you can find your longitude. Uh, and and of course, and then the noon hour sighting, you, you can get your latitude. So I went. So you're doing 180 knot, 180 knots east west, and the sun is coming the other way. And how to integrate that so you're just getting it right at meridian passage it, it, it was fun um also during a uh, a solar eclipse i did a i crossed a sun shot with a jupiter shot which you don't you can't often do so so i did that that is my the limit of my astronomical knowledge it was uh doing uh astro navigation 
and it was it was very satisfying to do. All right, moving right along. Uh, Oh, my commercial, that was my military flying commercial. I did 28 years of commercial. I flew 747s for 10 years. I was a captain on the Boeing 777 for 17 years. And I finished as what they call a senior check-in training captain. Um, the first grandchild was born. How long do you think we were going to live in Hong Kong after that? <laughs> I fought a valiant rear guard action. However, we moved back uh, in 2018, just before all the riots started in Hong Kong, funny enough. And for a year, I flew with the Pacific Coastal, flying at Little Sab 340, and finished my career with 22,000 flying hours. So almost three years in the air. So I'm going to talk about uh, the history of the aviation in Victoria. Uh, and here are the topics we're going to talk about. We're talking about balloons land planes, sea planes, and then finally, RAF station, or CAF station, Patricia Bay. That is the name of what is now Victoria International Airport. Okay. So, balloons, it's, there's a very interesting history of aviation in Victoria. Even though we're, we're at the end of the supply chain, sort of the end of the technology chain, end of the communications chain, but still, as as there is lots of uh, experimentation going on the the east coast uh, of uh, North America and of course in Europe, but out here there were things happening. So the first balloon ascent was way back in 1871, um, and it was a, a dummy of a child on board, and up it went, and it was just a hot air balloon, and it fluttered off into over the ocean and was lost. Um, many more balloon ascents uh, from 1880 till 1908. Interestingly, they were all done by professors. Now, I think you could just call yourself a professor, but you had to be a professor to understand how a hot air balloon works, right? Uh, even though you can make one as a child. Uh, and uh, some of these uh, included actual parachute drops just off Willows Beach into the ocean. That must have been warm. <laughs> so it, it was very, it was very hit and miss, and it was more of a spectacle. Uh, so uh, here is a place called Willows Field, uh, and it was actually Willows Exhibition Grounds. Um, th this exhibition, this wonderful pavilion here, burnt to the ground in about 1908, unfortunately. But this big, sort of elliptical area here and it, and it was it's for basically agricultural exhibitions here's willows beach right now and there's the exhibition grounds there which of course doesn't exist now so there was a lot of um there was a lot of activity relatively speaking out of uh, this area way back when so numerous flights by these curtis farman uh, biplanes uh, leading up to period of uh, 1914. You have to understand, aviation was in its infancy still then. You know, when the Wright brothers flew off of Kill Devil Hill, 1903, uh, it's South Carolina or North Carolina, anyway. Thank you very much. Um, they only flew 120 feet and it was catapult launched. So 120 feet. We have invented aviation. <laughs> The first sustained controllable flight wasn't until five years later. So they were discovering things as they went along. Um, war is a great catalyst for technological innovation. And boy, did it ever change uh, aviation uh, worldwide. So the return of these World War I airmen, and you can see we've got some military guys here, uh, saw the development of uh, lots of local training, air shows, air mail service, all the way to 1927. So here's before the war, yeah, probably before the war, these very basic pushers. And this is a Curtis Jenny, which was a main training aircraft uh, during the First World War. Um, now, this is interesting. If you come to the BC Aviation Museum, we have, a, we have a life size model of this. So the first Canadian designed, Canadian built, and Canadian flown aircraft was this Gibson twin plane. And um, it was flown out of Lansdowne Field. This is in 1910. So Lansdowne Field is still there. It's not as big as it was back then because there's been a housing development made. So I just wait, it's, you know, if you know it is Kitty Corner to the Hillside Mall. Um, uh, oh, first flight and crash. Um, <laughs> excuse me, sir, can I ask you to stand here for just a moment? Uh, you won't get hurt, I'll guarantee you. <laughs> um, I need you to be an oak tree. 
and this this yeah this is good okay and this this is the first flight of the gibson twin plane bzz, 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 bzz. <laughs> thank you sir thank you so um now i flew for 43 years but i've had the benefit of being quite a bit younger than this uh, <laughs> this guy here and um there is nothing right about this machine <laughs> the wings weren't wings uh there's no ailerons he had no lateral control so he can bank and turn the propeller is in, the engines in the middle and he's sitting on a plank right in front of it <laughs> so when he crashed uh, he was very lucky to not be killed um, the Gibson twin plane uh, does that at the uh, Made in Canada exhibition in Vancouver. Um, it was an important election year, and Gibson, who is right here in this bowler hat, um, he's having his guy stand on it to show how strong it is. He still couldn't get any supporters. He was doing this all self-funded. He took it to Calgary in 1911, where it flew at 100 feet for a mile after it had been quite extensively modified. Gust of wind and... We don't need you for this one, I'm sorry. <laughs> and what happened was um, uh, he had his assistant fly at this time uh, and uh, he said, I'm broke. He couldn't get any other funding. So he moved to America where he designed mining equipment. <laughs> so he went from above the ground to below the ground. Lands downfield from uh, 1927, 1931. Um, it's interesting that um, BC Airways started a big operation out of there. It, well, as big as it could. They leased the land uh, and they wound up getting this very advanced aircraft. 1927, this is a Ford tri-motor and it was called a safe aircraft because it had three engines and it was modern and it was, it, it was actually a pretty cool airplane. Um, the Victoria Aero Club also worked out of there. Um, visitors included Charles Lindbergh in 1931. Uh, disaster struck in 1927 though. And what happened was uh, one of these aircraft uh, was ready to go, but it was very, very foggy that day. And the parliamentary undersecretary for Winston Churchill was on board. He had just come from the Canadian Pacific, you know, these empress of the big ships that they had, and he wanted to get to Seattle. They had a route from Victoria to Seattle, and he said, let's go. And the pilot, the captain said, it's way too foggy. And he said, in England, they can take off when they can't even see the end of their nose. Captain took off. They didn't even make it to uh, uh, Port Angeles, and they crashed just to the south, and everyone was killed. And that that really, really um, stymied the development of land plane uh, aviation in uh, Victoria for for many years. There were some com complaints about uh, the uh, the noise from uh, Lansdowne Field, and so they moved up to a, this Gordon Head Field. This is UVic. Um, at this period, um, North America was, the whole world was embraced by the, the worldwide depression. But even despite that, it, it did continue. But by 1933, basically all land plane aviation, aviation, other than just local training and flying, had ceased. People were poor. people didn't have a lot of money, so no land plane aviation service till 1943. For 10 years, you could not take a land plane to from Victoria to Vancouver. So what do you do? You go into the harbor. So seaplanes started flying out of the harbor about uh, 1919. <laughs> Some pretty basic old aircraft here. Uh, airmail service uh, to Seattle was started. A Chinese commercial aviation school ran out of uh, the main harbor. A limited passenger service to Seattle and Vancouver from very, look, for very primitive. This is your facility. You walk down by this, this is B&K Wheat Flakes factory. And you walk down on this dodgy ramp, got into this, what is this called? This is a, a, um, I think that's a Boeing totem. And, um, and off you went. 
all of the uh, aviation initiatives um, to start up seaplane businesses out of Victoria Harbour were stymied by Canadian Pacific Steamship Lines. They were the big powerhouse uh, in the, the Victoria Harbour, and they said, out. So they did, and they went to Esquimalt Harbour. <laughs> So, so the only scheduled airline departures for 11 years were from uh, Squimalt Harbor and by a whole bunch of different uh, small operators. Um, very little commercial aviation in Greater Victoria till 1930, 1939, of course. The war started and things really started picking up. Uh, facilities were very basic, but what was really enjoyed, the... Um, is my sound okay? It seems like it's crackling a bit. Yeah, a little bit, but keep going. Okay, so this is called the End House Pub. And you would get your way down here, have a few um, uh, libations to boost your bravery, and then you take a variety of uh, seaplanes. Wow. Wow. People who complain about Victoria International Airport, I said, you have no idea. <laughs> so, so, and of course, you can see the map here of, of uh, the uh, Esquimalt Harbor and the dock, I believe we're talking about, was right about there. The sea, the uh, seaplane and the, what was it called? The End House Pub. Did I say that right? Okay. So here are some of the aircraft that they used back in those days. Boeing Totem. Sikorsky. You've heard of Sikorsky. Sikorsky, of course, makes helicopters. They stopped making um, fixed-wing aircraft uh, j just around during the Second World War. Belenka Pacemaker, De Havilland Rapide. I've actually flown in one of those. Um, so a whole variety of small operators flying a whole variety of aircraft. Well, in 1936, the RCF uh, c first considered uh, constructing an airfield at Patricia Bay. And this is, of course, the, uh, the Blether Farm. And what's interesting is Canadian National Railway line right, went right here to the, what's the current seaplane dock. There was an electric line that went right up here. They, they crossed all through, all over the, um, or through where the, uh, they built the, um, the airport. So that's right. So it's the Brether Farm, 700 acre site. Official approval is given in 38. And a surveying of the runway and grading started in the, the spring and summer of 39. Of course, in September 1st, uh, 39, the, um, uh, the Second World War started. The first official landing was August of 39, but it was a Department of Transport aircraft. Funny enough, there was always intended that this airport was going to be a military and a civil uh, airport. Start of the war, of course, expedited construction dramatically. So here's a shot. I'm going to come back here so I can see what you're seeing. Uh, yeah, this is around 40, 1942 or 1943. West Saanich Road-ish. Look at the town of Sydney. <laughs> There's the runway. These runways are exactly the same now, except they've just been extended a little bit, a little bit farther. Um, this is RAF, Royal Air Force, East Camp. This is RCAF, West Camp. I think they kept them apart, so to just keep the, the war in Europe and not right here. Um, this was the uh, officer's mess here, and uh, this is Hospital Hill. They call it, these are aircraft revetments. And there's a tiny little building there and that was the Trans Canada Airways terminal, that just a little single place, which is now a house. Uh, what else we got here? All major construction was finished by mid 1942, and RCF station Patricia Bay was the third largest air base in Canada during the Second World War. Um, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Uh, Oper oh, so um, what, what's important was that it was an operational station and an advanced training station. The um, third largest base, as I said here, 15 squadrons were here during the war, but not all at the same time. As you can see, 10,000 personnel passed through here for advanced training during the Second World War. Uh, 
and there were 139 fatalities. If any of you are familiar with Mills Road that runs along the uh, northern boundary of the airport, there's a place called, they still call it Hospital Hill, and you'll find about a dozen 12 or 14 foot high steel um, feathers with each individual who died uh, uh, operating out of uh, Patricia Bay during the war. So what, what, what did we have here? Why, I mean, with third largest station, the RCF built 100 airfields across Canada during the Second World War and because we ran the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan and, and trained 130,000 air crew during the war. So we flew these uh, initially. These, oh, these are actually built in Vancouver. So Blackburn Sharks, um, they're from, that was one of them, that means Coastal Artillery Cooperation Squadron. And uh, the K squadron is a kind of like a, a composite squadron. But look at these old things. Wow. Uh, we uh, flew Westland Lysanders. Um, are you familiar with any of these aircraft? Anybody? Okay. All right. So, so right there, we've got an expert. What kind of engine did it have the Lysander have then? <laughs> Yeah, and initially it was an ar army observation aircraft, um, but they didn't survive well in France in the summer of 1940. So they they made them for t to do to drop spies into uh, Europe during the war. Um, Bristol Mercury is the the name of the uh, the engine, by the way. But well done, thank you. <laughs> uh, we have um, some ferry battles. The, the Supermarine Stranraer. Um, Stranraer, by the way, is the name of the town in Scotland. Where's our Scottish lady? Where you take the ferry to Larne in Northern Ireland. Right. Stranraer. Stranraer. Yeah. Yeah, been there, done that. Um, the fellow who designed this in 1934, his name was Reginald Mitchell. He then, he then designed an aircraft that I know you know, and it was called the Spitfire. Quite a difference. Uh, we had some of uh, these Northrop Deltas, or the, this is a good picture of a Lockheed Hudson. Um, that's that's our museum one of this uh, Bolingbrook. Uh, Canada built 676 of these during the war. It was not a good airplane, uh, but uh, there were no German Messerschmitts over here to shoot us down, so we used them for the whole war. Um, they were pulled out of service in the Royal Air Force in Europe by 1941 because there were not, basically none left. Um, we have uh, Grum and Goose. These are still operating. If you ever go up to uh, Campbell River, excuse me, Port Hardy, where Wilderness Seaplane still operates these. Uh, this is a Canada's first um, Canadian designed bush plane. And this one is actually a picture of the museum uh, piece uh, because we took it from two or three wrecks, like crashed wrecks, and rebuilt it and we flew it. Um, it cost us $7,000 in insurance for a 15-minute test flight. <laughs> Thank you for your donations. Um, we don't fly it, because of, but we start up the engine every few weeks. What else we got? Uh, we had some Bristol Beauforts. We had a lot of these Hanley Page Hamdens. 37 of them crashed in the war. None were shot down. And I'm just going to show you why. Because... Um, are you familiar with uh, a, um, a piston engine aircraft? Okay, it's got the propeller going around. If the engine fails, you want to feather the propeller. Do you know what that means? To feather it so it's 90 degrees to the, the slip, slipstream. So there's very little drag. You don't want the propeller to keep turning. Because if it is, that means it's not a propeller, it's an impeller, which means drag. Then you have thrust on this side. And there's only one conclusion. You're going you're gonna to do a spiral right in. And this, look at the funny design in this. They, they couldn't stop it. So, uh, Averanson, we have kind of, these are training airplanes. Um, as, the war, uh, as the war continued from 39 through 39 to 45, we got better airplanes. And they tended to be American airplanes. Uh, Lockheed uh, Ventura replaced the number of airplanes. It was much better. And the, um, the Canso. Uh, which um, we built in Canada, as you can see here, and uh, much, much better than the Stranraer. We have a flyable one right by our museum right now, and uh, it needs to have some servicing done. Next summer, you can pay 
a hefty fee, and you can go for flight, uh, go for a flight in it. But what the great thing is, they have these great big observation blisters here, and it would be, it would be able to stand up and look as you fly over Victoria. Uh, we flew Liberators, and we also flew uh, Mosquitoes. Um, did you know a Mosquito was rebuilt about six years ago at Victoria Air Maintenance, and then it flew off? I think that, that probably would have been a seven or eight million dollar rebuild for that. He was a very rich guy. We flew Hawker Hurricane uh, fighters. We flew uh, Curtis uh, Kitty Hawk fighters. And by the way, um, when I say there was no air war on the West Coast, uh, Kitty Hawk fighters shot down two Japanese fire balloons. Uh, uh, during the uh, Second World War, right towards the end. Did you know that the Japanese sent 9,300 fire balloons over, of which about 900 hit North America? Um, and caused a big panic uh, amongst the military because they never released this to, uh, to the civil population. Uh, one of the balloons malfunctioned and it came down in Oregon to a f uh, amongst a family a uh, mom and her four kids were having a picnic. The kids ran out. The dad was at the car saying, don't go near that. The kids were too excited. They went up, it blew up, killed the mom and the four kids. Um, Americans were livid, uh, but they did not release that information. So when these balloons uh, started coming over, two were shot down uh, over Pat Bay. There was a third one that was shot down they don't like to talk about. It turned out to be an American radar calibration balloon. Okay. So. Um, Trans Canada Airlines uh, operated out of Pat Bay starting in 1943. Uh, and the history of what happened here during the war and then pa after the war with respect to um, aviation history in BC is way too extensive for me to get into just in a short lecture like this. But that just gives you an overview of of how aviation developed in Victoria, initially balloons off the beach, some land plane, some seaplane, and then the war came along and changed everything. Uh, okay, so are there any uh, questions about the short little spiel I've just had right now? Because then I'll move on to what we do at the BC Aviation Museum. Um, There's just a picture, we have two big hangars, the main hangar and the Henderson hangar. Um, oh, there we can see we have a, our, um, our bush plane, the Nordoin uh, Norseman, uh, the A26 Invader, and we have an airliner here. If you ever want to know what it was like to fly in 1955, this is a time capsule to 1955. I will guarantee it that you will be dissatisfied with every flight you take after this <laughs> because it's 41 inches of uh, seat pitch <laughs> as opposed to 32 for Air Canada, 31 WestJet, 29 for Jazz and 28 for Flare and Swoop. So, so here's where we are. Um, perhaps the most important thing is Mary's Bloom and Caffeine, which is right there. <laughs> um, it's hard not to get ahead of myself here, um, so I'll just follow my slides. Uh, who are we? We're 95% uh, volunteer organization. In other words, we're all volunteers, except we had to hire um, an executive director and administrator uh, this year because we could not keep up with all our projects uh, and all the paperwork involved, and it's, it's quite extensive. Um, it was created in 1988. We had three uh, interested groups that got together. We have 600 members, probably, probably that's 70 to 80 core volunteers. Um, we preserve, protect, and present Canadian aviation history with the emphasis on British Columbia. We do that for British Columbia because Alberta's got three museums, Saskatchewan's got museums, everybody has aviation museums. But what we do is specific to British Columbia because our history, especially our coastal history, is unique. We're a registered nonprofit organization and we're in, in, uh, we're in the societies, incorporated under the Societies Act of British Columbia. So what do we do? Uh, we display the history of uh, civil, commercial, and military uh, aviation. All were very instrumental, formative in uh, opening up the uh, province. We restore, rebuild historically, historically significant aircraft. And I'll show you one that's the only one in the world. We honor those who have perished in service and we have a memorial room. Uh, 
Um, by the way, if any of you have any relatives that perished during the Second World War, you can go into the memorial room. If they were in the RCF and their air crew, you can find out in two minutes uh, a short abstract of their history. And then we have an extensive library where you can go in and get considerable detail. Uh, we are, we're an important tourist attraction. Uh, we provide touch and learn. Oh, for kids. Our kids love it because we have this area where kids can go in and just mess with all the controls. Um, we have an 8,000 volume library and that's got another 1,000 CDs or DVDs. Um, uh, we, we do post, we do uh, public events, private events. So the um, Patterson Group had a gala dinner there in uh, April and we're doing the RCAF uh, centenary uh, dinner next year. And we have lots of special groups. When I say special groups, um, uh, a lot of groups that have, um, I have to be careful what's the politically correct way. Anyways, they're disadvantaged, they will come through. Um, we out front, we have this memorial to Hampton Gray. He was the last Canadian airman to die in the Second World War, two days before the Japanese surrendered. Uh, and he was awarded the Victoria Cross for his attack on this uh, destroyer in a place called Onagawa Bay. Uh, the Japanese witnessed it from the hills here, they, from other ships. His buddies that were orbiting up here, they saw this and went, oh, Hammy, and that was the end of him. He, he attacked the ship. They shot his airplane to pieces. He continued the attack. He sunk the, the destroyer, but he crashed on the other side and was killed. He was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. Um, I'm sure people are aware of the Victoria Cross. Did you know that the, the metal that is the metal that is uh, the metal is made from is from um, melted down bronze cannons from the Crimean War at the Battle of Balaclava. So very rare. Hammy Gray. He's from Nelson, BC. And ironically, tragically, his older brother was one of the very first RCF airmen killed in the Second World War. The only memorial to a foreign warrior in all of Japan is to Hammy Gray in the town of Onagawa. They were pretty impressed with him. So what we have out there, oh, first of all, has anybody been there? Okay, about, okay, about a quarter. Um, I hope you liked it. <laughs> That's great feedback. <laughs> so we got, we've got lots and lots of displays. Uh, and each one of these I could talk about for a while, but I won't. This is going to be just a short overview. Um, what I do want to talk about is the um, every one of these red dots here you see is a fatal crash during the Second World War. None of them were shot down. That was just engines and aircraft and bad weather, you know, things not working out well. Um, and I just hope we get to the story. Excuse me, can you go back? Yes, sir. So I noticed the dots are in line. The dots were in what? The bottom left there. The red dots are in a straight line. So is that the flight path where they were falling? Or? No. no. Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> um, I don't know that, what caused that. But the engines were not reliable. The aircraft themselves were not, at the beginning, were not very good. Um, bad weather, mountains, ocean, poor communication, uh, rudimentary navigation, and it just caused a lot of accidents. That's why there was no basic training done here during the Second World War. It was too dangerous. That was all done on the prairies, where if you're flying along and uh, my engine fails, pick a field. Uh, we have an artifacts room, uh, 13,000 artifacts at the uh, museum. Uh, and it says finishing up. We have finished up cataloging them. And uh, Michelle, our archivist, is an absolute, she's an absolute genius. Um, but you know, like along here, we have like 800 paintings, you know, and so there, a lot of, we get a lot of donations. Uh, and here we can see the kids area um, before and during. And that this isn't even a busy period. Sometimes we'll have 20 kids in there and it's just, uh, they're, they're really happy to come in. I said to um, one little fellow here the other day, I said, um, 
he was distinctive because he had really red hair, really good looking little fellow, about eight years old. I said, Have you been, I think you've been here before. And his dad goes, this is visit 20. <laughs> Um, I, I did a, um, uh, a tour with some uh, disadvantaged people. They were These young adults were absolutely lovely. So we do that. We have 36 uh, aircraft out at the, uh, the museum. The, uh, what have we got here? Well, there's a Gibson twin plane, the one that doesn't fly. And okay, it's, it's just, there's a whole variety of aircraft there. Um, there's one that I want to tell a story about. I'll, once we get to it. Okay, our restored airplanes. Uh, this is an Avro Anson. Um, we have, it says, okay, we've done six. These are from crashes. You have to understand this aircraft was just a crashed wreck, crumpled mush. And the guys spent years and completely rebuilt it. And as I say to them, you know, after I flew for 43 years, is I can fly them and I can break them but I can't fix them, sorry. We've rebuilt a bowling brook. That came from a farmer's field in, in Manitoba. Ah, this is the one I want to talk about. This is the Eastman Sea Rover. And this was found in a barn in Duncan with other parts up at Atlin Lake and one other site. And they got all these parts and we said, what the heck is it? We went to the Smithsonian and said, can you help us? And they came back and said, congratulations, you have the world's only Eastman Sea Rover. The story behind this, every aircraft has a story about who designed it, how they, you know, the design process, how they manufactured it, then how they operate and then how it was operated. And uh, Jim Eastman brought five of these up in 1927, 1929, excuse me, up to Vancouver. I think he was getting them out of the States before they were repossessed during the Great Depression. And they were used for um, uh, mining surveying. So they'd fly these uh, surveys into really remote areas. Remember, 1927, there weren't any airfields. So this is a flying boat. This is a wooden boat with metal cladding on it. Uh, engine right here it's a flying boat so you need to keep the propeller above the, out of the water so they put it right conveniently in front of the pilot's face <laughs> can you imagine what that would be like because these things spit oil and sparks and exhaust and yeah um the f they're used all the way up to 1942 and the funny thing is um they were event all eventually wrecked they said well wait a minute we can salvage the front of this and they cut them up and made motorboats out of them and if you come to the museum that's like the first thing that you'll see you'll see the eastman sea rover and the motorboat uh this norseman um uh, is we have flown this aircraft and i don't know if i can and some displays i can touch i can click on this and it makes noise let's see what happens oh here we go well, you could see the prop turning, uh, but there, there wasn't a lot of noise there, was there? I don't know the volume. It's almost close. Yep, you hear it. No, I can't get that. Oh, there we go. Okay, here's a North American Harvard. Why do I have this? Well, Canada had 3,300 of these during the war as an advanced pilot trainer. My father got his wings on these in 1950, after the war. Um, Hoffer H1 float plane, it's a replica. The first Canadian designed, built and flown float plane was in Vancouver in 1917. The Hoffer brothers were building a boat, uh, a luxury wooden yacht, a motor yacht for a guy named Bill Boeing and the Taclanite. And he came up and said, he came up to see how his it was, it was developing. And he saw and he said, well, what are you guys doing? That, that's, that's not a boat, that's an airplane. And he's like, oh yeah, we know. I said, so we thought we'd try making aircraft. He became quite good friends with the Hoffer brothers and said, how would you guys like to be Boeing Canada? I said, sure. And they built Boeing aircraft. They built, there was two factories in Vancouver, one at Coles Bay and one at, on Sea Island. 
where the international airport is now. And they built aircraft there uh, under license until 1945. Jillian Hoffer, now, I can't remember if that was the wife or the daughter, but the, uh, when they retired, they moved to uh, Sydney and he, they, he built a little boat works uh, at uh, Seam Harbor there. And um, his wife or daughter, I can't remember, um, bequeathed a bunch of land to the town of Sydney. By the way, any other years? Da Vinci's ornithopter. So an ornithopter is an aircraft that you have to flap the wings. Um, there's only one way that that, one direction that that aircraft would fly, and that would be straight down. <laughs> Although it, it's a beautiful construction, you know, it's, it's really quite fascinating. Um, the first successful ornithopter flight in the world, I believe, is a three or four years ago, the University of Toronto. Um, Ornithop so flapping wings is not the way to get airborne, folks. So what are we doing right now? We're working on an Avro Lancaster. Um, it uh, was a it was a bomber during the Second World War. 430 were built in Toronto. They all went overseas because there was no bomber command in Canada, and the. About half of them were shot down, and uh, the ones that returned, some of them were converted to um, uh, maritime patrol search and rescue aircraft. And this particular aircraft, uh, it's called FM-104, um, actually flew out of Comox. So it's, it's British Columbia, it's relevant, and so we're refinishing it to uh, this uh, post-war uh, colors here. And uh, hopefully we'll have it ready for... Um, static display in about two years. It's a big airplane, so it's going to it's going to take a while. Um, we're quite excited by this. The guys are working really hard because you're going to be able to walk through part of it uh, during our open house, which is next weekend. You can see the wings intersection and the uh, aircraft mounts. I am in awe of what the volunteers in the restoration hall can do. It's just, it just absolutely amazes me. If there's not a part, they make it. What else are we doing there? Oh, we have uh, five Rolls-Royce uh, Merlin engines. Um, Rolls-Royce named all their piston engines after birds of prey. So there's the Gosshawk, the Peregrine, the Kestrel, the Merlin, the Griffin, et cetera, et cetera, the Eagle. Um, and hopefully um, we can put one together and get one running, yeah, maybe even before the end of the year. So we'll see how that works. Very expensive, by the way, to, f to get these engines going again. If you want a flyable Merlin engine, because you're really rich and you have your own Spitfire, um, the, the engine alone is one million US dollars. Okay. That's for a flyable. Now we can make one that can run on the ground for much, much less than that, but still, wow, it's lots of money. Uh, we've had some new arrivals in last year. This is a Grumman Tracker. Um, if any of you are familiar with the uh, HMCS Bonaventure, our aircraft carrier up until 1969, uh, these were flown off. Uh, that is an anti-submarine warfare aircraft. And then afterwards, uh, once uh, they came ashore, uh, they're used as coastal patrol, fisheries patrol aircraft. This is a funny looking thing, isn't it? I've never been a fan of helicopters. Um, so. But we have two of these that are going to be coming uh, probably early September. Uh, they're coming from near Golden, BC. Uh, we already got the engines and rotor blades, but just getting the um, fuselages down to the museum, is it's, it's, it's just hellaciously expensive. Uh, what do we have here? Oh, there we have a consolidated uh, Canso. Uh, it's known as the Catalina, if you're American or British. Uh, 730 of these were built in Canada during the war, including in Vancouver at the Hoffer Brothers Boeing factory. Um, this aircraft actually flew out of Patricia Bay during World War II, uh, and it's now, uh, it's, it's right outside the museum now. It's going to be refurbished. It's going to be repainted into a different colors because uh, the Canadian Warbird Heritage in, Montreal, in, uh, in Hamilton own it now. And you will be able to go for a ride next year. Looking out this big bubble. Um, were you aware of uh, the two American bombers, World War II bombers that were at the Victoria Flying Club? Mm -hmm. Did you go for a ride? No. Too much money. Yeah. 
Oh, just wait for, oh, you're going to wait till next time, are you? <laughs> My son came over and I said, get your butt in one of those airplanes. And off he went, he was just thrilled. So. Okay, I'm glad you went out and saw them. It was very, it was quite impressive. Um, recent arrival. Did you see? Did you see in the paper uh, about the arrival of the CF-104? Um, it so impressive. Um, this air, this particular aircraft was used in uh, in Cold Lake for its entire career. Uh, it, it's one of the training aircraft, but it was it was fully operational. Um, it flew into Comox a couple times, did some things. Um, my father flew these for six years and was an instructor on them as well. This particular aircraft, this is F-731, uh, actually flew at Mach 2.4 one day, Mach 2.4, and it was still accelerating. The Starfighter, once it got that fast, kept on going and accelerating, but it got, you had these sensors in the, uh, in the intakes to say, hey, you got a big slow button slow down or you're going to melt um but it but there's it just it, it was like a lamborghini you know and it just looked like it was doing 500 miles an hour just standing still so we have this now and our plan is we'll we'll have this all chemically stripped and then we'll just see what condition it's in it's been sitting outside for 30 years uh and it, it, there's some parts of that are not in good condition and uh we'll then then we'll decide on the paint scheme that way that the, the best one for it but still, does it have a connection to BC? Yeah, a little bit tenuous. But uh, I went through my father's logbook, and uh, I see that he did fly the Starfighter out of Comox a number of times, because when they had the voodoos there, they go up there and they do some air fighting with the voodoos. The big dream. And now I just got. Uh, I'm on the the committee that is negotiating, and I just got a stern warning. Hey, I'm the president. I give out the warnings, but I was warned because um, in whom I'm doing this lecture, do not give away any confidential information. <laughs> oh, yes, you will. <laughs> the Martin Mars is I've, I've been all through it. Um, the uh, many people uh, know about the Mars. It's iconic in British Columbia because basically it saved BC for years, for 50 years and put out big fires. But it's 80 years old. And it, it, there now there's strain gauges all through the aircraft, hasn't flown for five years. So what we're trying to do is uh, to get Colson's, and they want to do it as well, believe me, we're, we're talking all the time. We're going to get it up and running and do a one-time ferry certificate from Port Alberni down to Patricia Bay. We're going to fly it down. Now, we'll go down that way because if something goes wrong, we can just drop it into the water and... <laughs> and taxied in. Once we get to Patricia Bay, there's been a lot of building around the, uh, the seaplane base there. They put in big stanchions for new um, uh, landing lights and things like that. We can't fit the Mars in. So about a month ago, we went to IOS, the Institute of Ocean Sciences there at Pat, Pat Bay, and said, can we have a look? Can, is there a way to get up here? And boy, do we, we got a lot of really good cooperation, and we, we think we can do it. It will cost a hundred thousand dollars just to get out of the water and to, across the airfield to the museum, because we're gonna well, we're gonna have to take down lamp stanchions, uh, stanchions and and fences and oh my good grief, portable buildings are gonna have to move. Um, it was gonna be about a hundred cars. We're gonna have to say you can't park here anymore. Uh, what else? Oh, then we got to move the the seaplanes that are in the way. So, but this would be um, the. Um, uh, what do we say, the, uh, the jewel in the crown, because we think this will be a big tourist draw. Oh, and when we get it, you're, you're going to be able to go through it. Absolutely. So to give you an idea how big the aircraft is, there's a Lancaster. The Lancaster will fit under one of its wings. So it is a huge aircraft. This is the size of a jumbo jet, by the way, uh, because the jumbo had the same uh, and I wish I flew for 10 years, um, had this, has the same 200 foot wingspan. It's, this is actually bigger in the fuselage area, 
um, but of course it's, it's shorter. So this is our idea of having a, a big new hangar, and the hangar will be a, um, a firefighting theme hangar. So we have two fire bombers out already. We're going to have a what they call a Bambi bucket, you know, the the bucket that the helicopters use, and we think it's pretty we think it's pretty topical now with our 400 fires that we have in BC. But the Mars itself is obsolete. It, it cannot be used in operations. So what's the future for us? Expansion. We need a new hangar. Thank you for your donations. <laughs> um, we're getting more aircraft and uh, we're making more displays. We're finishing the Lancaster. We're looking at um, this is coming for the open house. We're actually going to get a simulator that's going to move. Brand new one. Uh, we're building up our volunteer base. We're all the time looking for grants. And um, we've restructured for our expansion. So we have an executive director and a, an administration manager now. We were all, we were um, all volunteer until about three months ago. And I said, I, I got in, I said, we, we just can't do this. We cannot keep up with the administrative load. So this has been a great boon to us. So that visit finishes the presentation as a brief overview of uh, the rich aviation history of uh, Victoria. 1871 to 1945, the role of BC Aviation Museum. And thank you for your attention. And that is Hospital Hill. Well, you, you, you and we have very similar problems, it seems. Um, are there any questions? We, we have time for a couple. Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring the I'm gonna bring the microphone to you. Was the starfighter also called a widowmaker? <laughs> Don't ever say that in my presence. <laughs> um, it, that was a term uh, that was um, made up by the uh, German press. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. The widowmaker and. Um, the accident rate was no worse than the F-86 Sabre that preceded it, but it was just way louder and more dramatic, you know. So, but yes, it was also called the Lockheed Lawn Dart, uh, the Zip, the, the uh, man with a missile with a man in it. it, had a lot of names. I never met a pilot who did not love flying the aircraft, though, because be, it was difficult to fly. It was challenging, but its performance was better than anything, basically anything around. Question number two. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, are you bringing down Hawaii or Philippines from Colson? Are you bringing down uh, Hawaii or Philippines? The, the, the two uh, remaining tankers, I guess. Hawaii. Hawaii's the one. Said Hawaii on the plane anyway. Great. Yes. Hawaii. Um, we are pretty much out of time. I'd like to thank Steve very much. It's fascinating. I'll, I'll have to come. You haven't been? I haven't been. I also, have a, I also have a group of young adults with special needs who would love to see it too. Then they are more welcome. Open house next weekend. Uh, yeah, I saw that. 19th and 20th. Uh, it's just by donation only. Uh, please come in here. We'll have a lot of airplanes. There'll be, there'll be food. There will be ice cream. There will be porta potties. <laughs> okay, well, I, I have to run and be somewhere else, so. Thank you. Thank you.
Are we ready to go? Yeah. Okay. So this is what's up in the sky. And I'm actually going to see if I can show you the sky because um, subject to today's uh, what's up in the sky, apart from my thumb there, is going to be um, something about um, mobile astronomy with mobile devices. So I am actually going to, um, first of all, I'm going to get rid of that background and show you that we are in fact here at the center of the universe. And um, here are people. And uh, so what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to show you a slide that tells me what we're going to do. Um, let's see, um, screen sharing. Sorry. Uh, what happens if I push this button? That one, yeah. Okay, right. Okay, so you can see my screen, I hope. So, um, it's useful to talk about while we talk about the sky. Um, what are uh, mobile aids for astronomy? Uh, using your, using your, um, using your phone or a tablet. Um, I'm here on an iPad um, because computers are too heavy to lug around. Um, I've got a couple of things on this iPad. I, I also have a an Android phone, so they're both available from that, for, from both and. Uh, uh, and they're gonna, what we're going to do is show you a couple of things that are actually relatively inexpensive if they cost anything at all. Um, that can really help you um, when you are either with a telescope or binoculars or just looking around on the sky by yourself. So um, to begin with, um, here is the first one. Um, and this is a sneaky way of also telling you something about the phases of the moon today. So this is this application is called uh, it's called Moonwatch uh, on Android and Moon Calendar Watch. It's the same thing. And you can see that this is the phase of the moon tonight. You can also see uh, it says sunrise and sunset um, on the left. And it says um, it says the moon rise and moon set on the right. So um, on the left, you can see it's the tomorrow sunrise is 6 a.m. and sunset is at, at, uh, at uh, half past eight. The moon is not going to rise until quarter to two, um, which is going to be useful for the next topic here. Um, the, you see the moon is in a waning crescent. Um, so that means it's new moon next week. Um, you, can, you can tell it's a waning rather than a waxing crescent. Waxing is when the moon is coming out of uh, new moon into and getting bigger, and the waning is, of course, when it's past full moon and getting smaller. And um, <clears throat> so one way of remembering this is that the waxing moon makes the shape of a, the letter D, and the waning moon makes the shape makes the shape of the letter C. So you can remember this by talking about daring and koi. The waiting moon is koi and the waxing moon is daring. So that's, this is a nice little application. If I hit this button, it shows me uh, the phase of the moon as as the calendar goes goes on. So that's that's pretty cool. This is, I think it's two ninety nine or something. So a little cheap. Um, the other thing, the, the next thing I wanted to show you after telling you about the moon is the fact that um, Stellarium, which uh, is commonly used as a full planetarium program, has got a very nice app for a, um, for a tablet. And here I am pointing up at the sky, and you can see that it shows you it's five minutes past nine, if I see in the bottom right hand corner. And this is what the sky actually looks like if you could actually see it through the trees and the fact that it's not really dark yet. Um, so I'm looking towards the center of the galaxy, and I dot the bright stars that I could see low in the sky are the constellations of 
Scorpius and Sagittarius. Remember that, you know, although it's a little bit off now, the way, the way this works is your star signs under your horoscopes, which we don't talk about, but you probably know all about, um, represent what is, where, where the sun is supposed to be in the sky at the time. And so you know that Scorpius is, the constellation Scorpio is, is October and Sagittarius is November. So the sun isn't in those at the moment. It's um, somewhere else. Um, but anyway, um, the thing I wanted to show you about Stellarium um, is the subject of our normal what's up in the sky, which is, I can show you, if I click on this calendar button, um, where all the planets are right now. Um, and this is much nicer than the, the, the PC version, which has got more and more planetarium, uh, you know, serious astronomy related stuff, but it shows you when all of the planets are gonna rise and set right now. Now, if you look, there's a planet missing. And the planet that's missing is Mercury, Mount Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, is Venus. And the reason why it's missing is Venus is almost exactly behind the sun right now. Um, the Venus is, you would have seen it a few months ago, was at what's called a maximum elongation, which is the furthest distance from the sun. And you could see it as a crescent. Um, but now it's gone behind the sun and it's invisible. Um, the, the moon you can see is, is up really quite late. And Mercury, you can see, I can click on these things here and it'll show you where Mercury actually is. Um, or it would because it's set. There it is, it's down there. Um, as Mercury highlighted, you see Mars is just above it. If I go back to this, this thing here, um, you'll see that Mars also, these two planets, Mercury and Mars, they're going to set Mercury in 10 minutes and less than 10 minutes, and Mars in about 20 minutes. Um, and so um, I can also, because I can go through um, go through the calendar, I can also, um, with this application, tell you, go away. Um, I can also tell you where it's going at, at this time, but uh, in the next uh, little while, I can sort of whiz through the sky to tomorrow and, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is going to tell us quite a bit about what the sky is going to look like later. Um, uh, you can see that Saturn is about to rise. And, uh, and um, if I can try and find it, looking around, there it is over there. Um, this, is, this is where Saturn, oh, this is tomorrow, excuse me. Let me get my calendar back. Sorry. So that's, oh, that's yesterday. Right, okay. So this is more or less where we are now. And uh, Saturn isn't up yet, but um, you can see that um, tonight it's up at 10 past, uh, uh, 10 past 9. Um, the, the most important thing I need to tell you about now, though, is the um, the Perseus meteor, meteor shower, which peaks tonight. So Perseus, the Perseids, um, are a meteor shower which can be quite prolific. It can produce up to 150. Um, it can produce up to 150 uh, meteors per hour. And the Perseids appear to come from, I think it's up this way. Um, uh, uh, yeah, Perseus, up here. So I'm looking at, at the radiant now. The radiant is the point in the sky which they appear to come from. It's just, the, just below the constellation Cassiopeia, the big W that many people are very familiar with. And um, the, the way this works is the Perseids are the result of um, a comet, the comet Swift-Tuttle that uh, appeared in 1862 and then in 1992, but um, it's, it's no longer visible. And what you see is debris left over from the comet's tail that is in Earth's orbit and Earth passes through it every August. And at some point we pass through the peak and that is what gives you um, the meteors. So, um, and there can be quite a lot because there's a lot of debris out there. Um, 
And the best way of seeing it, um, I should re remind you, is it's best seen from a lounge chair on a dark site. That is, um, don't really need a telescope, don't really need binoculars. You just have to sit and look up and hope to see the meteors. It's, it's kind of sporadic, um, but um, we're hoping, because um, the moon, as we told you earlier on, is not um, going, not rising until quarter to two, it's going to be quite dark out here. So when it gets a bit darker, we should be able to look up and see, um, because it's sort of, um, if you imagine what the center of the universe looks like, it's sort of over the, over the top of the building, we should be able to look up and see a few meteors um, when, when it's really dark here uh, a little later. Okay, so just to recap, that, that's the other thing. And there are, the planets are largely not, not visible um, because they're either setting or not, not risen yet. And finally, um, um, I, I recommend taking a look at uh, getting, getting the Stellarium for tablets. You can take it outside and, and look at it. Um, I think it's really quite cheap. Even if even the paid version, although there's a free version, and the Moonwatch calendar is also quite useful. So uh, that's it for what's up in the sky. Thank you. Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't realize. What I'm doing. <laughs> um, thank you, Ben. I don't know whether. Could you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. It's just I was trying to keep others from not being quite so noisy. But...